I swear to God that we have this discussion every single year. Why in the hell are we having more rule changes other than either reversing or keeping some of the rule changes for this impacted season this year without even testing or looking at the impact that they could potentially make? Uh, we have new rules for 2021. Let's, let's have a look and talk about what they are. Okay, so a couple of days ago, Steve Hawking came out and confirmed that there were going to be some rule changes for the season of 2021, as well as some things that haven't been confirmed yet that are actually really super important and much more important than this garbage that he's dishing out at us. I have no idea where this has come from. Some of the things that just don't even make sense. And when you actually look at the stuff that is still in limbo, why the hell are they working on this and not things like the salary cap and list sizes and, you know, just things like that. What are we going to, you know, how many games are we going to go back to? How many minutes are we going to go back to per game? So on and so forth. These are the much more important issues. And yet Steve Hawking comes out with these random ass bloody rule changes that are going to happen next year. So uh, let's have a look at what exactly we know to be confirmed being changed. Okay. So basically there's a new cap on the interchange. It uh, was as of, you know, this year and for the past, I want to say maybe five years or something to that degree capped at 90 interchanges. Now the reasoning specifically for the reduction to 75 as of next year is because Steve Hawking believes that this is going to open up the game because uh, pressure acts have been increasing year on year for the last five years, which means that, you know, players are fitter, they're around the ball more, they're around the ball more because the ball doesn't move as much as what it used to. So of course they're going to be around the ball wall, which then in turn creates more pressure acts, which then ups the amount of pressure acts in a game and just creates this skewed statistics that he's working off of. I mean, by that own metric, you only have to look at the fact that since they've been dropping interchange caps, pressure acts have been going up. Now, don't you think there's some kind of correlation there? Or is it just that Steve Hawking thinks that this is a really weird coincidence? Let's drop it more. When the idea to introduce capped interchanges was announced eight years ago or something like that, I was, I was sort of, you know, let's wait and see. Let's see what happens. I think there's some merit behind the logic, right? Um, you know, fatigued players don't run as much and therefore they can't get to each contest. However, that thinking is kind of flawed because as we see, the ball doesn't really move much. So of course, it's not going to be leaving the area and then players can't get to the next area because they're fatigued. So that that space opens up more when the ball isn't leaving the area anyway because the players are fatigued and their skills are lessened, which means they're not as clean with the ball in hand. It's, it, there's a circle here, Steve, man, come on. You must see it, right? What is the point in dropping these interchange caps? Leave it at 90, don't drop it. It's, yeah, it's a really perplexing thing um, for me, that one. But the, the really, really strange, Stupid rule that's come out. An amendment for players standing on the mark with 50 meter penalties to be imposed on players who move outside a one meter level of tolerance laterally off the mark before play on has been called. Now, this new rule in particular raises some very, very key issues for me. Steve Hawking is quoted as saying this. We think that will open up the game 
it will open up the 45 degree angle pass option, which is the best real estate. In my opinion, what makes a sport good and what makes teams good is having the ability to counteract certain attacking plays. Now, yes, I know that you know, footy in general is a much more defensive game than what it used to be. And in my mind, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If an opposition team can figure out your attacking game plan and defend against it, then you either one, need to come up with a better attacking game plan, or two, need to have a backup game plan to, you know, work around the defense that is currently going against your current attacking plan. If you can't do either of those teams, then your team is failing. Um, it could be a litany of, of reasons why your team cannot get around or over the defense of a team. But bringing in rules that directly restricts teams from being able to defend is, in my mind, a really bizarre and mind-bogglingly stupid thing to bring into the game. I want to bring you just one scenario, and there are more scenarios that can play out other than this one that can hamper a defensive team. But I just want to I just want to give you one just to show you how detrimental this particular rule change is. The defender stands up and mans the mark. Now, he can't really move anyway. It's basically one step left, one step right. Any further than that, he gets a 50-meter penalty against him. Now, what happens a lot, and I mean a lot, in games these days is a teammate of the player awarded the free kick can be circling behind that player to receive a hand, for, you know, a hand pass. Now, that's all well and good because that player in the past or even now has been able to then carry on, shepherd the, the uh, defender so that the handball receive has a bit more clear space to then use the ball in, in much more open space. However, teams were kind of catching on to this and what would happen was the player sort of following the player running through, so the defender following the attacker following, you know, through the play, the man standing the mark would effectively change over with the other defender. So he would then run on to block up that space that the, that the man is trying to run into and the man trailing would then take up the position on the mark. It's effectively a handover of players and stops that particular attacking play. It is a system that can be used by a team and only good teams really actually do this. You'll see young teams don't do this as often because they're not drilled as much into it. Only good, real, you know, top eight sort of teams tend to do this consistently. This new rule actively prevents a team from being able to defend this particular play. How, how else is a team supposed to do this without sacrificing a player behind the man on the mark, of which there can only be one person on the mark, which has always been a rule? I don't know why this had to be specified, because Steve Hawking seems to think that there's, there can be upwards of six men on a mark, which is just factually untrue. The only time we've ever seen multiple people near a mark is when a shot on goal is happening, and all of those other players are behind the mark, where they're legally allowed to be, and I would assume still continue to be. You can't penalize someone for standing behind the mark of the player already standing behind the mark. That's just ridiculous. So I, I, I just take really great issue with introducing a rule that definitively is aimed at stopping a particular type of defense for a particular type of attack. So we're penalizing good, structured, coached, well-coached teams now for absolutely no reason other than to open up the game. I mean, I'm sorry, if you're a good enough team, you can work out a way to get around this and it's 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 not bringing in a rule like this. Wow. The AFL has to be the only competition in the world, the only professional competition in the world that actively brings in or alters rules 
on the fly, and I legitimately mean on the fly, there has been no testing of these new rules, these new interpretations. There has been no behind the scenes simulations of how this would actually work in effect. There has been no ab no training with umpires as to be able to bring these rules in. Because I can tell you right now, at the start of next year, umpires are going to be messing up this rule so horribly bad because they haven't had the time to actually nail it, get their head around how it works and implement it correctly. In last year's video with the 2020 rule changes that I made at the start of this year, I requested, and obviously no one from the AFL house is going to be watching this channel, right? And I understand that, but I did request you know, just leave the game for three years and then make changes for it. Let the rules settle, let coaches settle with the rules and see how the game evolves naturally. I, I see that the AFL house blames coaches all the time for the way that the game is being played now. And yes, that is technically true. The coaches are the ones coaching their teams to play in a certain way. But they're playing in a certain way based on the rules introduced by the AFL to try and counter this sort of shenanigans. And it's back... Uh, yeah, I... Mm. <laughs> I guess what staggers me the most is that they've come out and announced this stuff, right? This really trivial, unimportant bullshit before announcing what's going to be happening with list sizes or the salary cap or how many games we're going to be playing next year or any of the actual meaningful information that clubs and fans actually need for the season of 2021. Like AFL House, what are you doing with your time. I know this has been a bit of a ranting video, uh, and I do not apologize for that at all because the AFL deserves it. So, you know, um, if you do watch this, Steve Hawking, you're, a, you're an idiot. <laughs> I do plan on being around a bit more often than what I have been. I know I haven't made any videos per se for quite a while, but uh, there are some things that I want to talk about. And this was... Uh, this was definitely definitely one of them so uh thank you very much for watching and i will see you in the next video whenever that comes out bye